Welcome to Unibet's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden and I'm joined once again by our resident expert analyst, Dan the Outlaw Hardy. The UFC's leading lady, Ronda Rousey, is making her return to the Octagon. This time, she will defend her women's bantamweight title on enemy territory against the undefeated Brazilian, Betch Coheia. Ronda Rousey! She's a female hero. I know I'm going to retire undefeated. You're undeniable. Oh, oh my! Wow! Betch Coheia! She wants Rousey. This fight is more than just an athletic competition. It's about punishing someone. So that is the headliner for 190, but lots to look out for on the card, including the Noguera brothers and also the Ultimate Fighter finales. But another very interesting bout in the strawweight division involves Claudia Gadea and newcomer to the organization, Jessica Aguilar, who comes in with a lot of heat and a 10-fight win streak. Yeah, Joanna Yudrejcik's going to be paying a lot of attention to that fight because Gadea has probably been her toughest test so far in she the wants, octagon. Yeah. Um, with a win here over Aguilar, that's going to put her right in line for it for a shot at the title, so that's one to watch. Also, we've got Bigfoot against Palale, so there'll be some, some tremors in the octagon when they step inside. There will indeed. So let's bring it back to the main event then. The dominant champion, the most dominant female athlete on the planet, Ronda Rousey, defends her title in Brazil against Betch Coheia, and Ronda is not happy. No. Words have been exchanged and she's been offended, plus a couple of her teammates two of the four horsewomen have been defeated by Kohea so she is looking to I quote she won't leave looking the same way that's I don't know what she means by that whether <laughs> she's going to drag this fight out but she's looking to do some damage yeah well this has been an interesting one because I mean Ronda's always quite a, quite an intense person anyway but we've never seen her this fired up before for a fight and I'm interested to see whether that affects her approach to the fight obviously usually she gets in there and tries to get the fight finished as quickly as possible but with a grudge against Betch Kohea there might be a bit more of uh, you know a bit more play there, a bit more striking, maybe some ground and pound. So I'm interested to see how Ronda approaches this, and also given the fact that it's in Brazil, that changes things a lot as well. So I I'm excited to see how this one plays out. Okay, well let's turn back the clock to Ronda's debut, uh, and what a debut it was. She's come on a lot since then, but even that first stepping into the octagon was brilliant. It was, it was against Liz Carmouche, and you'll see as always with Ronda, as soon as the fight starts, she's right into the centre of the octagon, ready to trade punches. Ultimately, she wants to get her hands on her opponent, clinch and get the fight to the floor. Liz Carmouche did take Ronda's back, was working a cross face and did a good job there. But ultimately, Ronda you know, kept her calm, escaped the position and then started working that strong ground game that she's got. And here you'll see her start to attempt an arm triangle, then she abandons that, switches to mount, sets up the arm bar and then straight sits back into it. Really nice. Now, Liz Carmouche does a good job of getting to her knees here, but immediately from this position, Ronda reaches underneath her thigh and rolls her over the top. Because obviously, in this position here, you can pull that arm out from, from uh, the arm bar in a position in the, on the top. So in order for, uh, for Ronda to secure that arm and to get that arm bar, putting Liz Carmouche on the back was the best thing to do. And, and it's not like Ronda's limited by one particular arm bar. She can catch him from any position. Rolling any... arm bars oh. from the side, from the top. Exactly, it's amazing. And, and as, as one person that knows better than anybody is, is Misha Tate. So if we take a look at that fight next, you'll see um, a much tougher fight against Misha Tate. The first one was, was uh, you know, a, a pretty one-sided fight for Ronda, but Misha Tate knew what to expect this time. She came in ready and she gave Ronda a hell of a fight. I mean, this went into the third round, which was, you know, we, we've not seen Ronda go that, that far into, into a fight in the Octagon before, but this is really what sets her apart. All right, gosh, she's straight into Beautiful. looking for the mount, straight off the bat. Really nice. And just the spatial awareness, just the understanding of, what's this? A fake, she, she's going to step through as if she's going to sweep and then reaches for the opposite foot instead. Really nice, just little tricks and little uh, little techniques that she's picked up and used over the years. Obviously, having a background in judo from an uh, Olympic level yeah, is going to Olympic <laughs> bronze. Yeah, yeah, it's going to really help. But it's it's that split second where most people would have to stop and think about what they're going to do. Ronda doesn't have that. She doesn't need that calculation time. Here, straight into an armbar attack here from a different position. You'll see her adjust the hips in a second. What she's going to do is pull that shin up onto the back of uh, Misha Tate's head uses the thigh, rolls her straight over with a nice swim move 
and then straight into an arm bar. And Misha Tate was not messing with that one. The first time she, she damaged her arm too badly, the second time she wasn't going to argue with Ronda. <laughs> and we, we've seen an evolution of Ronda's game. Mm. Uh, the Glendale Boxing Gym is where she's doing a lot of stuff with her yeah. hands and she's putting them to good use. Yeah, most definitely. She's looked every training camp, she's looked better and better. She looks really sharp on the pads and the work that she's doing with Coach Edmund Targaryen is, is, is a fantastic uh, striking coach and it's paying off. One thing that I will say about Ronda is that she does get caught in the brawl a little bit. She does like to stand and trade. And against Betch Coe, that may be not a good idea because she is she's a brawler through and through. Powerful as well. Very, very powerful. This is interesting though. Sarah McMahon, a freestyle wrestler, Olympic freestyle wrestler. Yeah. Look how look at the distance that they're keeping here between the hips. Now Sarah McMahon does she's probably gonna want a body lock really, but the risk in that is getting Ronda's hips close to her. So in this position, the distance between the two allowed Ronda to bring this knee up as we got from first hand, you'll see us at the side of the octagon here. A beautiful knee to the floating rib there just sent Sarah McMahon straight to the canvas. And that's the risk with Ronda, because if you clinch up, you either keep her hips away and you've got to worry about the striking, or you allow her to engage her hips and then you've got to, got to worry about getting launched. That's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the hips close together, that's what a judo player's looking for, I'm taking it, because exactly. then you've got all the hip tosses and things exactly. like that. Exactly, that's where the leverage comes from. All of the throws are hips in. She uses a lot of nice foot sweeps, but ultimately when she's got an opponent locked up, she wants to get hips on hips. So, so she now she has a very nice feint that she can use to start using other tricks. Exactly. exactly. Uh, other tricks that we've seen perhaps in her next fight as well. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, let's continue on. So, obviously, you know, th this fight was, was a very quick one. Again, straight into the centre of the octagon, standing trading, not afraid to take punches to land punches is Ronda, and, and that's the fighter aspect of it. But watch this, overhand right, rocks her opponent, knee to the midsection, and then straight into a throw. Didn't give Davis an opportunity to get back into the fight. Here we go, let's watch it again. So, they come out, they start to trade. Quite 50-50, really, Ronda eats a couple of shots, no one really standing out here, no one doing anything great until that one big right hand. Then the knee to follow straight into the throw. And, and Davis was unconscious before she hit the floor there. She was dazed by the right hand and that yeah. gave Ronda just enough time to land a knee and then go straight into a throw. And it, it's that reaction time that she's cutting down. She, she reacts so much quicker than most people in any situation when it comes to a clinch. So if I was Betch Coe's coach, I'd be saying just stay away from her, keep as much distance as possible. And we'll talk about that because she does a good job of building frames. Let's just focus on Ronda for now. Let's have a look at a fantastic finish here against Kat Zingano. Who is who, arguably going to be the, the biggest threat to yeah, her throne. And, and still potentially could be. I mean, this was a 14 second fight and it's difficult to really glean anything from this. But this just shows Definitely Ronda. the wrong choice to yeah. jump in on Ronda. Yeah, if you've, got, if you've got an opponent that just beat someone in, in 16 seconds, I'd probably give 30 <laughs> seconds of the fight just to make sure that I wasn't in the same situation. Uh, Kat Zingano comes running out at a beautiful scramble. Ronda ends up on top and steps straight over to isolate this arm. It's a really nice position. Again, it's an arm bar, but it's a different arm bar. It's not an arm like, bar from Threatens a mount. shoulder almost yeah, and then yeah. straight arm bar. I mean, this is fully locked out here. Ronda's got this leg hooked through the back so, uh, so Kat Zingano can't roll out of it. And from that position, there was nowhere to go. She had to tap. And knowing that Ronda doesn't hold back on those arm bars, yeah. it's probably the right thing to do. I think so too. <laughs> I think so too. So let's take a look at Betch Kohea then. She has dispatched two of the four horsewomen, which yeah. was uh, the dubbed by the, the media. And that was close to Ronda, you know, two of her teammates being beaten. But her debut again was against a veteran of the sport and she did very well. Someone else who just keeps on improving and yeah. is undefeated. Yeah. Well, Julie Kedzie, yes, a, a very tough opponent for her, a, a very well-respected uh, and well-known uh, fighter in, in the women's divisions. And Betch Coeas, it was just a tenacity pushing forward that edged this decision. Like, standing in the pocket, willing to catch kicks and, and trade punches, a very gritty approach, a very, well, her nickname's Pitbull, it's, it, it's very synonymous with her fighting style. She's, she's gritty, she likes to get her teeth into her opponents, and she doesn't like to give ground. And this is what makes it interesting with Ronda because neither of them like to take a backward step. Now, like I was saying with Bet, she needs to keep a little bit of distance, but having that confidence to, to start throwing as soon as Ronda steps in is gonna make a big difference. This is something else we talked about with Kane the other week, this okay. anti-grappling. Using this underneath the, underneath the arm to not engage the underhook or the overhook. And Shayna Baszler on the floor, she does a good job of this. She, you know, she, she works, she's still trying to feed this underhook in, but as soon as she does, Kohea comes inside, denies that and then slides back and puts a head position in. Really nice position to land some nice short elbows. 
and then a couple of seconds later, Shayna Baszler starts working for a triangle, and you can see Betsy Coe stepping over the top. Good awareness of what's coming at her, and even though the, the submission went a little bit deeper, she did the right things. She's got the knee in the ass, so she can push and pry her way out, and then slide that elbow through, which will get her free of that position. Yeah. And one more position, which is going to be really useful for her again, is this building of a frame. The hands on the back of the head to break that posture of Shayna Baszler. Look at that curve in her spine. Very difficult to do anything with that curve in your spine. You need a straight a back and your yeah. head up. Good sprawl uh, as, as Shayna Baszler turns around and does the right thing, tries to cut a corner here. Fantastic work by Coea to stay on her feet, stay spread and keep that weight on top of her opponent. And building frames like I was saying, hands on the hips. So even if you can't see where your opponent is, you can feel where they're moving. Monitor. You can, exactly, yeah. you can keep that post. Does a great job with that. And then from there, starts posting on the head, lands a couple of nice elbows, and then here comes the onslaught of the boxing combinations. And she did not let up on Shayna Baszler until the referee stepped in. John McCarthy did a good job here to see when the fighter was no longer intelligently defending himself. Heavily outstructed. Oh. Really nice choice of, and selection of punches as well. Yeah, mixing them up, good body shots as well. A couple of nice elbows thrown in there. But it's that confidence in her hand, that confidence in the power that she throws. And she commits, and you can see her there counting down the four horsewomen. Yeah. That's where the story gets interesting, because obviously Shayna Baszler was the first one. Then we go into Jessamine Duke, which is the second one. Okay. And two different opponents, different sizes, different abilities. Both people that train with Ronda, and, and you can see Jessamine Duke using a judo throw, and Coea does a good job of taking that back that top position. Yeah. So it's almost like she's experienced talents that Ronda has through fighters that are maybe slightly less talented than Ronda. Okay. Which is interesting, I think, because, you know, she, she, she's contended against some judo, she's contended against some striking, against a girl that's taller than her, against a girl that's got a good clinch, and we've seen her come through. She's done good things. She did, she did really well with low kicks against Jessamine Duke as well, which started to really show later in the fight when you could see the bruising coming out on Duke's leg. Again, with the trip straight into the armbar that Ronda was using against Kat Zingano oh, yeah. here. You can see the position, but aware of it, manages to get herself out of it. So that's going to be important, that confidence that she can defend those submissions. Whether she can do it against Ronda or not, who knows. But we've seen her do it in the past. We know that she's got the knowledge to do it. So now it's all about reaction time and speed. Can she do it quick enough to stop Ronda? Looks like she's had the, the perfect sort of proving ground each time yeah. with these different elements, as you've pointed out. Definitely. For the champion. But... Champion, very dominant indeed. So let's take a look at the facts and the stats for this one and see what they can tell us in this matchup. Ronda Rousey, the champion, as we see, the most armbar submissions, and she doesn't hang about in that octagon either, Dan. Not at all, no. <laughs> Although, having said that, average fight length, 3 minutes 29, that's probably due to Misha Tate. That would be a lot less if it wasn't for that three-rounder against Tate. The thing that stands out again for me is Betch Coe's takedown defense, 80%. Now, I'm not saying that she's going to be able to defend 80% of Ronda's takedowns because it's likely that Ronda's going to have some other tricks that, that Coe has not come up against. But she has all the pieces. She knows what to do in each position, breaking the posture, using the whizzer, getting heavy hips on an opponent that's shooting. So all of these pieces, if she can bring them all together against Ronda, she could give us some real problems. And a striking defense is good as well. It's worth noting. OK, good stuff. Thanks, Dan. So. Let's take a quick look at the odds for this fight then. For one of these women, the O must go. Can Kohea be the first woman to defeat Ronda Rousey? Or will the champion continue her dominance over the division with a victory in Brazil? Will we see a finish or will the fight be left in the hands of the judges? As always, there are odds to be found on every round and it's all brought to you by Unibet. Watch and bet live with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. So also on the card, Dan, the Noguera brothers. Yeah. Big Nog and Little Nog. Let's talk about Little Nog because he's fighting Shogun. So that is a fight that we've seen before. It was very exciting mm. indeed. I think that uh, Noguera has come on the record and said that he wants the same excitement, but he certainly wants a different outcome. Yeah. It was a great fight. It was one for the ages, really. I mean, 10 years ago, it was a long time. But it was a real war. Both of these guys, there was a lot of pride on the line, a lot of bragging rights for Brazil, obviously, with both of these guys being natives. This took place in uh, Pride Fight and Championships in Japan, and it was a, a real big fight at the time. You can see the, the crowd just extending 90,000 yeah. seats. And it was one of the best fights of the year. It was. It really was. And just the aggression of both guys was outstanding. Really, really both put it on the line. Good trades, good combinations, a lot of good clinch work, some good ground exchanges and knockdowns on both sides as well. These guys were not pulling any punches, and 
given the fact that they're both they're both aged a little bit now, they're both more mature in their fighting styles. I, I'm interested to see how they match up this time. I'm, I'm expecting it to not be quite as reckless, at least on on one side of the fight, because Shogun thrives on that recklessness. Yeah. Having ten years to have processed this. I'm interested to see what Nagira does coming into this fight because obviously he wants this win. Obviously he wants a better result than last time. Yeah. And and knowing the fact, knowing that both of these guys, they've, they've had quite parallel careers as they've progressed. Shogun's obviously been quite prolific in, in many ways, as 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 Nagira. So for them to match up now, ten years later, having had all of that experience and that previous knowledge of them fighting yeah. in the past. Yeah. It makes for a fascinating matchup, and, and who knows what's going to happen. It does, and, and Little Nog's actually really developed since then. And, mm. and interestingly, Shogun's gone back to Rafael Cordero, who's produced two UFC champions this year or in the last 12 months. That's that's a, a great storyline for this yeah. one. Yeah. But uh, Little Nog's big brother is also on the card. <laughs> uh, he's fighting someone who's massive. He's yes. had experience of fighting tall guys yeah. before, though. Yeah. Well, Nagira was that guy that they always used to throw in against the tough guys in, in Pride. And you can see here against Semi Shilt, who's seven foot tall, exactly the same as Stefan Struve, and a fantastic kickboxer as well is Shilt. So as soon as the fight started, you could see Nagira really pushing for that takedown. And once the fight got to the ground, then you can see his silky smooth ground skills and same nice height guard on the ground. pass. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. You can see a nice guard pass there. Now he's, now he's in mount, he's going to land some good ground and pound. He's setting up this armbar, and Schilt does a good job of sitting up at the right position to avoid the armbar, but unfortunately sits up into a triangle. And when you get caught in a triangle against a guy like Nagira, you really have to be fed or to escape Still, it's, it. it's difficult to, you know, when you've got a seven-foot guy yeah. just trying to oh, lever yeah. himself out. Yeah, especially if he picks you up, that's a long way down. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's just a, I mean, semi Schilt's a massive human being. You remember him fighting in the UFC against guys like Josh Barnett. A real tough guy, tough guy for anybody to fight. And so, for Nagira stepping in there and fighting Stefan Struve, who is also seven foot tall, there's got to be a little bit of confidence to know that he's already beaten a guy of this yeah. height before. And and Struve is, you know, he's more than happy to grapple with him as well. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, he's coming in a bit injury free as well because he's had his injury troubles and he's just coming off of the back of the Ultimate Fighter as a coach. Mm. So nice and rejuvenated yeah. to face the big Dutchman who is super confident coming into this. He yeah. now is healthy as well, and he's looking for a finish, saying that he can actually submit Nogueira. Yeah, well, I mean, why not? You never know what Struve's capable of. This is a beautiful armbar over LeVar Johnson here. Very, very quick. And pulled guard as well, which we don't see very often anymore in, in mixed martial arts. So well, he can pull guard from across the octagon. <laughs> That's true. This was probably his biggest win to date, as we were discussing earlier. Stipe Miocic is doing wonderful things right now in the heavyweight division, and Struve just kept the pressure on him. You know, and. And given the fact that he has such long reach as well, he can hit you, like you said, from across the octagon. A lot of people see Struve, you know, given the fact that he's uh, of his height and his age, and think that he's got a bright future in yeah. the sport. And if he can uh, he knock off a guy like Big Nagera, that's a, a huge name for his record. You know, after Nagera, then you start looking into the top ten, and you start thinking about what you need to do to get a title shot. And Struve's an awkward fight, awkward fight for anybody, really, at seven yeah. foot tall. Yeah, Struve fighting one of his heroes. So, thanks, Dan. Plenty to look forward to on this card, which kicks off what is another big month of events. In August, the Octagon travels to Nashville, Tennessee, for fight nights headlined by light heavyweight contenders Glover Teixeira and Ovin St. Preux, before heading up to Canada, where a pivotal bout in the featherweight division between Max Holloway and Charles Oliveira takes place at UFC Fight Night Saskatoon. As always, you can get all the pre-fight odds for those events with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. On the next episode of Inside the Octagon, Dan and I will be back previewing UFC 191 and the highly anticipated rematch between Demetrius Johnson and John Dodson for the flyweight world title. Make sure you get involved in the conversation by tweeting your questions about that fight to us at Unibet using the hashtag Inside the Octagon. That's it from us. Enjoy UFC 190. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.